Yes, my friends. With all great respect to my friends at and who fought at Normandy, today is D-Day. All respect to the folks that were at the actual D-Day, but this is what we call in the NFL report day. And you report to your first practice. You're there at the Novacare Center. Many teams around the NFL are starting their journey this year, today, to see who will end up in the Super Bowl. No question about it. Um, there was a lot of news today. I'm going to give you my takeaway here in a second on Nick and also Howie. By the way, that joint press conference stuff. I still don't get it. Now, again, it's the first one, but I really don't see frontline coaches with their GM sitting by their side. It's kind of weird, but not anything to sit there and make a segment off of, but it's weird. And by the way, it's also weird, the relationship between those two guys. I'll, I'll, I'll get into it here in a minute. The news, obviously, of the day is Cooper DeJean. Let me tell you something about missing training camp. It's not so much physically. It's more so mentally. Let me give you just my small world. So I've told you guys many times I was preparing for the upcoming NF or college football season in 1987. Um, we were going to play Florida that Saturday. And for some reason, the NCAA came in and penalized me for transferring where today you can do that. It's not an issue. People go into the portal. I had graduated. All the things that you do today, they penalize the University of Miami and me and took my senior year away. Well, that's in September. That was around September 6th. I had missed all of the Buccaneer training camp, everything. And when I showed up, I never caught up. I never caught up because all the things that they were installing, and all the things that all the other rookies had an opportunity to do, I just never caught up. No matter how much homework I did, no matter how much I did when it came to the studying of trying to figure out what they wanted me to do defensively. And then on top of that, I didn't even know the position that I was playing, which was no. So I never got reps. And in today's NFL, with these training camps set up the way they are, it, this is almost an unattainable task for Cooper DeJean to say that he'll have an impact in the first half of the season. This is going to be a little bit here. It's the time missed in the laboratory more so than on the field that in that league, athleticism, you can get away with that in college. You cannot get away with that when you are at the pro level. Everybody's good. What's up, Devontae? Appreciate it, my friend. Okay? And, and we're, we're going to talk about all the things that Jalen said. I'm going to go into Jalen's comments as well. Um, the jeans got to hit him. Hey, all, all I'm saying is now it's a hamstring injury. They're saying he's going to be out three. Three weeks with a training camp like the Eagles have is enormous when it comes to lost time. Okay, it's enormous with lost time. That's a good call, Sean. Now with the injury to DeGene, do you go get Justin Simmons to try to help your depth now until you can get DeGene back and up to speed? DeGene will be fine, but it, hey, bro, it's the missed time. Okay, it's the missed time that you don't understand. When you miss not only the reps, but when you miss the classroom and in the laboratory stuff, that's also essential in your growth. That was Jalen's best presser as an eagle, no doubt. Jamison, we're going to get all into that here. Eduardo's right. He better be a sponge and soak up that knowledge and how the defense will be ran. Absolutely. Hey, if I were him, I would make sure that I talk to Vic. I try to get Vic's extra time. Hey, you watch everything diligently. Still, that's not going to be enough.
but you cannot not be focused. You have to have the same focus, not participating, because when you get in there, they're going to expect you to know exactly what to do. And if you don't, they're not going to play you. No matter how good you are, they will not play you. And especially a guy like Vic Fangio, if you don't have your knowledge up to speed, by the way, his game speed's not going to be up to par. His practice speed's not going to be up to par. This is not good. Okay? However, it, will it derail his entire season? No. But I think it will derail half his season. I do. And now it's one thing to be in OTAs and minicamp. Now you're putting the pads on. Okay? You got to get out there and show that you can be in a critical situation for you to be able to be an impact player and help them try to resolve some of their issues. There were some things that were said by some players that I didn't like. And we're going to get into all that. By the way, I really loved what I saw with one thing. You know what's being reported out there? And I text a couple people. I saw some read options with Barkley. There were some read options with Saquon Barkley. That looked like there was going to be something potentially. If you're practicing it, you're going to use it. Okay? If you're at this time right now, July 24th, if you're, if you're practicing it, you're going to use it. Flexing goes RPO. I don't know if it looked like that. It looked more like a read option to me on what that thing looked like a bit. So that's positive. I think today was a very positive football day for the Eagles. Okay? I think it was a positive day. Temper, but I think it was a positive day. ESPN saw Hurts in a red jersey and assumed he was in a gang. <laughs> Funny. I got it. Deshaun Jackson, nicely put. Yeah, by the way, I also saw Howard Eskin was out there at Eagle Camp. We'll hit on that a little bit later, too. 40 RTD to Goddard. Good. Everything, again, had no problem with it. Nick and Howie, their first presser, as I said, was a little weird. Seeing the both of them together. Billy 500 at 3.30 along with Mark Holmes, as we always do. Battle Royale will be at 3.30. Xander Krause who's been doing a marvelous job today, keeping you updated on all the things going on over at the Nova Care Center here on Jacob Sports, will be with us at 4.30. Don't forget, right after the program, a special edition of Birds 365 with John McMullen, who was out there all day at the press conferences. I heard John ask some really great questions. So we will have exclusive stuff for you here on Jacob Sports. That'll be a special edition of Birds 365 right after our program at 6 o'clock Eastern time. So. Good. All right. Um, I got to tell you, Big Sills takeaway from the Nick Sirianni and Howie Roseman press conference. Let's get into it. And then we'll talk a little bit about Jalen. The relationship between the two. Jameson. Also, Paris Campbell was Jalen's main target today. That must mean that they're working on wide receiver three. So they don't listen to anything Eagles say. Players, coaches, and especially the GM. Show me, don't tell me. You're not wrong, Sam. You're not wrong. You're not wrong on that. Okay? Remember something. You're right. When you hear stuff like that, you've got to temper it. And you've got to use your own judgment on what you've seen the last three years. Okay, show me. So here's my takeaways. You know, the press conference felt uncomfortable with those two. I think Howie Roseman has one of the worst personalities on the planet. He's just not a, he's like a, he's a CPA kind of guy or a librarian and he's not funny. And, but again, that's not an indictment on his ability to run the team. He's just, he, he makes it uncomfortable. Like, it's just uncomfortable. And then Nick is not funny either. His daughter has more personality. 
So it's not really – these two guys don't come off well behind a mic. It, it, and together, it's a bad comedy show. It just comes off – again, wait a minute. It's not an indictment on being a coach. Nobody's going to say that Bill Parcells doesn't have a great personality and that Bill Belichick has a great one. Okay? That's, that's, that's not an indictment on being a coach. Yeah. Hey, tipping birds, you know, it, it's, it's kind of hilarious in a way to watch it because it looks so forced when those two guys get behind a microphone. It just looks weird. And I, it's not that I don't believe it. It's just that they're not good behind a mic. Not one of those guys. And hang out, you know, the noise. And, uh, you know, we get the crowd control in the background. I'm glad that we brought the noise. And you're like, this is really dorky. They're like nerds. It's like the battle of the revenge of the nerds or something. Okay. But again, it's not a big, it's, it's, it's nothing to indict a guy on his job. Okay. It's not, it just comes off really weird. Sirianni and Nick in the relationship and Nick's relationship. Um, Sirianni said this, it's all good. Um, you know, I look around and every single time what we're trying to do is we're trying to do the very best that we possibly can to make Jalen better and to make the entire football team better. And my job as a head coach is to make sure that we have everything all good. And it was a setup question by ESP. ESP, this whole thing was set up. ESP asked the question right out of the gate. How's your, it's like being at the uh, White House press secretary's uh, press conference. They went to ESP and they told him to ask Nick Sirianni that question. How's the relationship between you and Jalen? Because that's the number one thing that was left out there in the ether after Jalen left for the summer. It's a setup. It, it was like an interview with someone that you knew Joe Biden was going to have the answers to. That's exactly what that was. So, but we, again, it needed, to, it was something that needed to be answered. So it was a setup. So you have to really realize how much of it is true. Okay. Um, how are we answering a lot of the questions? I found out something very interesting about the personnel on your football team that I really finally had the conviction of saying with this. Um, the, the hiring of the coordinators and then getting the coordinators' opinions on players such as Quinion Mitchell. Um, Nick went to him after the fact of Quinion Mitchell. How he said it in the press conference, I had already made my decision up. And when Nick came to me about his personal relationship that he had with the head coach, it made me feel better about the pick. He, he didn't ask Nick what he thought. Nick went to him after. Nick had no say in that decision-making. I thought there was going to be say in the decision-making. Okay. I thought it was going to be, a, you know, that Nick brought that to the table. That wasn't true. How he said it at the press conference today. He said this. He goes, yeah, I felt better about the pick. So get this. How he didn't even go to Nick Sirianni and ask him anything about Quinion Mitchell and his relationship with the head coach at Toledo. He had already had a prior relationship, he said, with the coach. But I felt better about it after. Nick told me about the relationship that he had and what he was told about Quinion Mitchell. I felt better about the pick. Nick had no say in this pick. This was a 100% Howie Roseman selection. You can go back, and by the way, these are words that your own guys are saying. This is not me talking. So you know for a fact, his influence, and quite frankly, some of the coaches on that staff he does not ask Nick his opinion on personnel. That came out of Howie Roseman's mouth. Um, 
he, like I said, had some input after the fact, made him feel better about his pick. It's quite an indictment. Your head football coach has no say in the players that get put on his team. Okay. Um, it's called acclimation week, according to Nick. Put a lot of things in, conditioning stuff this week. So what was called acclimation week. Um As I said, that just weird behind the mic to both of them. Uh, I, I Sometimes when he's talking about the offense, I really don't know what he's talking about. Sometimes it's going to look different than what it did a year ago. It's going to be this. And I, I, I got lost sometimes. Listen to him. Sorry for being off topic. Your thoughts on Mitch Kovic and how he's going to perform as a – Hey, 34, I'll do that later. Promise you. I promise you I owe you. Okay, 34? Promise you. Um, I told you about Cooper DeGene. That's a big loss for them. Um, James Bradbury. The versatility is going to be key for him making the team. Playing him at safety. And putting him at the cornerback position. What did I see? According to some people that were out there, they said that, if I'm not mistaken here, I want to get it right, that they had Keely Ringo, Quinion Mitchell on the second team at the cornerback positions, Bradbury at safety versus Tristan McCollum. Those were your second team guys. So Quinion Mitchell started camp. As a backup, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to finish that way. Okay, that doesn't mean it'll finish that way. Okay, um, trading in, um, trade incoming for Dingleberry. They had him playing at safety all day today. Eduardo, nobody on the planet is going to pick up twelve million bucks when there's a ninety percent chance you're going to cut the guy and you can get him for league minimum. Why would I do that? And give a draft choice up. I'm going to keep hammering that. I will say Jalen was very assertive. He was straight to the point and no BS. I loved how he shut everything down before the first question. It, and, and again, Keith, it was a complete setup, but it was addressed. So at the end of the day, yes, you're right. It was a complete setup question by the organization and Bob Lang. He's not bullshitting me, but it needed to be addressed. You're right. Um, I would say this to you. Some one thing here. There, there's so many great things. Uh, true that Tyler Steen's going to get the first crack at right guard. He was asked questions about the new role CEO, him being able to go around the room and go around the offices, going in and talking and teaching players. That I would not be doing. What Nick has to do as a CEO is not coach the players. You know what you do? You coach the coaches. You coach the coaches. Okay? You, you might say something to a player, but his job as CEO, CEO doesn't come down to a sales rep and coach him. He goes to the market manager and talks to the market manager about the guy's inability to make a sale. That's how you coach when you're at that CEO level. A CEO level doesn't supersede the position coach and undermine him. You let the guy that coaches him coach. And then you go to him with suggestions. And maybe if you tell him, hey, I'm going to ask something to him, I don't want you going to any of those players and telling them any kind of input that might take them off of what Fangio or Kellen Moore said. Okay? I mean, it's a stupid conversation. Howie said this, new folks in the secondary, he said, we had to address it, and I didn't do a very good job last year at it. Accountability. 
Very good. Okay, very good. Uh, there's going to be some position battles. Right guard, probably. CB2. Maybe a safety position, linebacker position, edge. They still believe in N'Kobe Dean, which is troubling. They think N'Kobe Dean has incredible upside. And because N'Kobe Dean told them that he wanted the pads on today, that did something to them. And how he said he's hoping that Jalen Hurts gets back to being an MVP. Let me give you my Hurts stuff because I saw Hurts' is a presser on two. And I believe that it goes in, in this order. I trust the owner. I trust Howie. And I trust Nick. And I personally think that's probably the order. He looks at the owner first. He looks at Howie second. And he looks at Nick third. How many places do you think that have successful coaches? Do you actually think that uh, Brock Purdy has more respect for John Lynch than he does Kyle Shanahan? Do you actually truly believe that when you look at the people, uh, Nick DaCosta in, uh, or DaCosta in, um, in Baltimore, you really think that Lamar Jackson has more respect for DaCosta than he does John Harbaugh? Again, it's a, it's a structural thing for me. And anytime I hear a player put things in order like that, you know how his priority list looks. Okay? How do I know that was the order? Listen to the interview, dude. Listen to the interview. Slagger, it's right there on eagles.com or WIP. Go listen to his comments. How do I know? I heard it. I heard it from Hertz's mouth. Okay? That's how I know. <laughs> I make a comment that Jalen put those three guys in order. And he goes, how do you know he said it that way? Because I heard him. Okay? Um, last year's problems are preparing me for 2024. Cool. Cool. Okay. My number one objective this offseason was to work with tight ends and wide receivers, and we would do a lot of things. You know what I loved what I heard, too? That Vic Fangio sends clips of the OTAs and minicamps to the players for things for them to work on as they were getting ready for camp. That is so awesome. And the technology that you get for that is so awesome. I, I mean, incredible. Hey, hey, Slagger, I don't give a shit how you heard it. I'm listening to it as an ex-player. You're listening to it as a guy who eats cotton candy in the stands. Remember that, Slagger. You're the guy with the banner in the stands. I'm the guy that listens to coaches for 30 years. So whatever, you keep eating the cotton candy and waving the pom-poms, and I'll let you know how it rolls in a locker room. This was something great that Jalen Hurts said. Talent takes you far, and it takes you far, but it doesn't take you to a championship. A team takes you to a championship. Great. As I said, working with the tight ends, wide receivers. He says, I got to make this offense my own. He goes, I'm getting better at reading motion and being understanding of what they're doing when they slide their defenses. So I'm getting better at it, but I've got to consistently get better. Good. Um, he said, my relationship with Kellen and Nick is good. There was another quote that I got to say that I loved. That to me was one of the most important things you can, I mean, I wrote it down. 
You know, by the way, this is Hurts' fifth year in the league. Come on, kid. It's the fifth year in the league, guy. Fifth year. I think Jalen made an effort today to, at least publicly, whether it's true or not, to put the relationship issues uh, down that he had. I'm trying to look for that. Here. Here's what's the most important thing I think that was said at today's pressers, especially by Jalen Hurts. I trust Nick Sirianni to lead us to the right direction. That's the most I've ever heard him say. I don't know if he believes that. I don't know if that was told to him to say. I don't really care. I love that he said it. Because what it does is, What's ever being said behind in the locker room and what the players are thinking stays in the locker room. But what's being told publicly, the media and fans don't need to know. That's a great comment. Do I believe it? Somewhat. I, I, I got it, Sean. It is scripted. So what? He addressed it. It was a setup question. But the Eagles wanted to make sure that you out there had the number one question that was the number one issue this offseason addressed right out of the top. And it was by their mouthpiece, ESP. They have two mouthpieces, Howard Eskin and ESP. Two guys that they covet and two guys they protect. You think there's any coincidence that ESP had the hardest question that was asked to Nick and those guys, Howie Roseman got offended when you started talking to him about Hassan Reddick at the last presser. You don't think those guys would have went nuts if the first question was, how is your relationship with the quarterback and you going into training camp? Really? Wow. That was, where'd that come from? That guy's not a product provocative interviewer that Elliot Shore Parks guy is not one of the interview guys he's not that talented like he's not a great interview I mean he's he just puts things out that they tell him to put out I mean this guy doesn't put out provocative interviews Jeff McClain does I think Jeff McClain, Marcus Hayes, those guys, those guys are great interviewers because they ask compelling questions. That was the compelling question out of the top of the show. And you think that guy has that kind of ability? Absolutely not. He's not that good. <laughs> he's good at giving and getting out the information. But he's not that good at that. Okay. Remember something about Jeff McClain and Marcus Hayes. They're some of the most red people. So, I mean, I think one of the most important things that was said by Jalen Hurts is, whether you believe it or not, again, it's not important if you believe it. I trust Nick Sirianni to lead us in the right direction. That doesn't even sound like Hurts. Those aren't his words. Those are Bob Lang's words. Who in their right fucking mind would believe he said that? But, again, I'm okay with that. Okay? I'm okay with him addressing it and getting it out of the way. Because you know why? Once again, they need to rally the troops in the locker room and build a cohesiveness in that locker room as teammates that you say something in there. It can be trusted to stay in there. Why are we at? Are you fucking crazy, Prince? Emphasizing the negative? I said that was one of the absolute best things that Jalen Hurts has done in his endorsement of Nick Sirianni since he's been with Nick. How's that fucking negative? 
That's not negative. Talking about, hey, how are we taking accountability for not putting the proper people on the team a year ago in the secondary? That's accountability. You win when you take accountability for your failures, dude. What are you fucking talking about? I said today was a great day for clearing the air. What are you missing? I mean, what are you missing? Okay. Gotcha, Prince. Fair enough. Prince gets mulligans. He gives me mulligans. Thank you, Prince. All good. Okay? All good. Dude, it was a good day. Whether it's true or not, it's not important. Okay? It's not important. Jalen Hurts had to get off his chest. By the way, you know, when, when Jalen was asked, hey, we all got to be on the same page, man. Or what, what was the other what was the other quote he had about here? Here's another great quote. Here's another great one. And this to me is sounds like him. The other one doesn't. I don't know about that, Sills. I don't like them forcing Hertz to co-sign little Nick to seem disingenuous to me. It is disingenuous. But do you really think Jalen Hurts is going to do something making $51 million if he doesn't want to do it? I don't think that guy is forced to do that shit. You make that kind of money, man. You got to see it at the boardroom. You know what I'm saying? Marshall, whether it's true or not, this sounds more like him to me. Okay? By the way, please hit the like button, guys. If we made it, we can make it. Jalen today. Okay. Yes. All that's good, Keith. Keith, here's another one. Hurts. I think we're in a good place. He's talking about Nick and his relationship. I think, look at this. Just listen to it and tell me what your takeaway is on this. Here's Jalen Hurts' words. His personal words, slagger, hurts. I think we are in a good place. Not sure, but he thinks they're in a good place. I think anytime you have any frustration and you have adversity that you have to overcome, Okay, you have to overcome it. It's got to be supported by all to overcome some adversity and frustrations. He's flat out telling you he had a problem with Nick last year and that they seemingly have resolved it. I'll tell you what they did today, the Eagles. And, and, and Prince, you can kill me on this one. They went way out of their way to make sure little Nikki Sirianni's feelings were addressed. Instead of just addressing going into training camp and not worrying about 2023 or the offseason, the um, way people are looking at the head coach, they went out of their way today to make Nick Sirianni feel that he's part of the team. Okay. How he at the press conference, Jalen giving these phony ass endorsements. You know, I mean, they went way out of their way today. Yeah. Marshall. Now that's, this is more hurts. Don't you agree? Than the, Hey, what sounds like Bob Lang? Let me show you something here, guys. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prince. Here, what sounds more like the Eagle PR department 
And what sounds more like Jalen Hurts? I trust Nick Sirianni to lead us in the right direction. Jalen Hurts. Here's Jalen Hurts. I think we are in a good place. I think anytime you have any frustration, anytime you have adversity, you have to overcome it. And you have to support one another. That sounds more like Jalen. This other one sounds like a company line. Which leads me to believe the whole thing was bullshit. But they addressed it. Get this. I'm now I'm now compromising myself so that the Eagles could, can at least move on from how Nick's feelings are. This was all about Nick Sirianni's feelings today. It's kind of pathetic. I, I, hey, the, 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 the Howie Roseman press conference, let Nick do a press conference himself. I think they're afraid. I think it's a matter of being on the same page. I think it's if we're on the same page, we could have accomplished the things that we could have and didn't learn. If it's if we didn't, it's a learning experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dan Silly, I was at practice. I saw Hertz running the RPO formation. I saw a little bit of read option myself, Arnold, when they were do, using that with Barkley. Why does Nick Sirianni have to have a co-press conference with Howie and not be by himself? I, I've never seen that. John Lynch doesn't do press conferences with Kyle Shanahan. And Les Snead doesn't do press conferences with Sean McVay. I don't know why he needs a babysitter. If it's not Big Dom, it's Howie. This is really weird how they do business like that. The imaging of that organization and making sure they control the narrative is so important and, and completely one of the most important things. You're never going to get that from a reporter that covers the Eagles because they're never going to say that. But I'm telling you, they run that team weird. And I mean from the PR angle. PR angle. It's a weird dynamic. No team in the league does that. There's, there's the only other weird dynamic I can see that does that. It's Cowboys. That's that's a weird dynamic. Just weird. How they want to control everything, and how they want to make sure that, like, um, you know, they wanted to get out today that Nick Sirianni, you know, it's really um, his his feelings were important. So weird. This is how he's trying to control everything. Him and Jeffrey Lurie. I think it's more Jeffrey Lurie. I don't know if how he sits around with Bob Lang talking about narratives and shit. I think it's the owner. Personally, I think all the conversations that they've had with my bosses have come directly from the owner to Bob. I I, I don't really think how he sits around worrying. Well, I, he kind of does probably, but not a lot. I think he listens. Because you know why? They listen because they dress the issues right out of the gate. So again, they did the right thing today. But they went overboard and they exposed themselves. Eagles can definitely gain the NFC division and home field advantage this year. We'll see. Still not there. Got to see them on the field on defense. Um, Another thing. That came out of practice today. They lined up in a three front, but with two wide. So it's more of a, um, what they're trying to do is, somebody said something in here that, I, I told you, Sills, it would be more of a five, it would be more of a five-man D-line. That's not true. They lined up today with Davis at the nose, Carter at the end, Williams at the end, and Huff and Sweat on the edges, on, on on Will and Sam. So your two outside guys to keep the edges and set the edges are Huff and Sweat, and your interior guys are Carter and Milton, and on the nose, it's going to look, it's, it's going to look like a five front. 
But those guys are stand-up ends. They don't have their hand in the dirt. They got their stand-up ends out there. Bryce Huff at six feet. Six one's not going to play defensive end versus Trent Williams. He's getting murdered. Run that guy who, who's, who was not a very good defensive end and doesn't really play first and second down. You're going to line up against Trent Williams or you're going to line up against the Packers with a six foot guy, six one guy who's not good against the run. Be careful on that. Um, when the F have Jalen ever come off front runner? Um, I never said Jalen was a front runner. Could have been someone else you're talking to. So all good. They didn't have Dean starting. I saw that. I, I, I saw that. How he was traumatized by Chip Kelly and he'll probably be on the sidelines holding Nikki's hand, disciple. Disciple, here's the one thing you got to think of when it comes to Howie. I don't think Howie is traumatized by Chip. I think all the things that he did wrong that during that time is not going to come back to bite him, putting people in position. You know, you know the one thing that Howie does to make sure that he doesn't ever get put into the broom closet? He has complete autonomy and control over the quarterback, the coaches, some of the uh, analytics people, all the things that, you know, when people go next to head coach, there he is with how he's intel, his players, his analytics department, I mean, his coaches. How does he not run that team? He told you today in the decision-making of Quinion Mitchell, he never asked Nick his opinion. I found that to be crazy. So when you're picking players, you don't ask your head coach, what position of need do you think we should go to first? You just do it without his input? I mean, that's not a head coach. I heard Xander saying, guy's got a great record. How do you not have say over the people you hire? Player-wise and coaching-wise, and then when the guy's drafting, he doesn't even ask your opinion. That's a tough room to manage. That's a tough room to manage. Again, I want to pull it back and look. They did the right thing today by getting this out of the way. Okay. I'm probably not going to bring it up unless it becomes a problem as we get into the season. But I'm probably not going to bring it up again because they addressed it. Did you believe it? Kind of no. But all you could do is ask a question. Hey, what's your relationship with the quarterback? Jalen answered it with that statement that the organization of Bob Lang put out. And then Jalen addressed it later. And he answered it better in his own words. Like here, just a couple times here, his relationship, here, where's, where's his? Here it is. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're in a good place. We're in a good place. We're, we're here. I think we're in a good place. That's a far cry from saying Nick Sirianni is going to put me in a position or whatever that thing was. Here, I trust Nick Sirianni to lead us in the right direction. That's not him. Guy doesn't even talk like that. But, go. Steve goes like this. Tell me how wrong Steve is here. Dan's worried about relationships and feelings. I'm not worried about the feelings, guy. I could give a shit about feelings. You think Tom Brady and Bill Belichick cared about their feelings? But they had to care about their relationship for 20 years. Okay? Yeah, Steve, you worry about your relationship, whether or not you think you're D coordinator. What kind of relationship do you think Xavier Howard and Jalen Ramsey have with Vic Fangio last year? Good or bad? That thing went off the rails. They hated him. 
Nobody got anything productively done. Both guys. Cowboys still in shambles, needing to pay CD. That's a total shit show. By the way, Philly 500 will be with us at 3.30 along with Mark Holmes as we are here in training camp. Jalen's a front runner. I don't subscribe to that. Okay, that's right. The real. Who gives a shit about feelings? This is football. Who cares about how you are? Only people that care about that shit are PR departments. Completely went out of their way. By the way, my final installment of what I'm expecting this year from these players for personal goals. We're going to do that. Big sales, personal expectations for Eagle players. I did three of them. This is the final one. We're going to do that here in a second. I don't want Nick and Jalen being best friends. Biases run too deep in that dynamic. It makes a decision to bench a guy who is underperforming much more difficult than it has to be. That's a correct comment there, Sam. Dude, a good head coach is not your buddy. A good head coach is a guy who's got the team's best interest at heart and not just one player's at heart. You know how that differentials? Just like with um, what Mike Tomlin says, I don't have to treat you guys the same, and I don't. But one thing is for sure, everyone's going to be in the room is going to be respected the same. You know how you guys are differentiated? On Tuesdays with direct deposits. That ain't my job to make you feel better about your life and about who you are. That's a you thing. That's what makes Tomlin such a great coach. Hey, you get separated on Tuesdays with your direct deposit. For me, I'm not going to treat you the same when you're coming, who's going to be a superstar on this team and who's not. But I'm going to respect you the same as everybody in my locker room. That's what a head coach does. Honest conversations. That's right, man. F those feelings, man. Feelings have nothing to do. Hey, let me tell you this. When Jimmy Johnson cut me, I didn't talk to him for 10 years. It's a true story. He called me up on his boat on my show when I was in Tampa. And it had been 10 years I hadn't talked to J.J. 10 years. And he called me as a caller. Hard to find somebody who played with Jalen that doesn't consider him a great leader. He really doesn't care what you all think. That's all that matters. Um, okay. He shouldn't. Hey. Fat Mac, tell me something that you want You want Jalen to get, what, a medal for that? Does it give a shit what people think? Congratulations. Welcome to the NFL. Welcome to being the face of a franchise. You don't get kudos for that, dude. That's expected. I got $51 million in the bank. Why would I get – the only person that gives a shit like that is AJ, what people say about him. When you're a quarterback like that, you're the face of the team. Who gives a shit what anybody says? I get paid every Tuesday and Saturday. Way to go, real. Good for you, man. Good for you. Okay, let's let's put the bow on that and say this. They got the BS out of the way. Now it's going to work. Now it's going to work. Once again, I want to go back and I want to say this. Some good things out there today. Here. Keely Ringo and Quinion Mitchell are in the second team at corner. Brad Berry's at safety and Tristan McCullum was on the second team Safety positions. Jordan Davis was at the nose. Jalen Carter, left end. Milton Williams, right end. Huff and Sweat were Sam and Will. Not bad. That's a good look. Okay, that's a good look. It's a good look. All right. I wrote down my final 
Eagles expectations for this year. What I'm expecting. Hey, by the way, how many people believe today was a good day for Philly? For the team, for Jalen, for Nick. A little overboard, a little gushy for me. Okay? A little gushy. Thank you, Prince. Please hit the like button, guys. Thank you. Maxson goes, it was decent. Charlie says yes. Aaron Arnold says yes. It was a good day, right? Yeah. And, and, and Mad Bird, I think so. Kind of where I am. See, look, I, I they got what they needed out of the way, but once again, they don't know when to stop. They keep going overboard with their shit. They just didn't know when to stop. They kept going on and on about it. And then it became contrived. Prince says, very good day. Okay, yeah, because they got it out of the way. Prince, it's the end of the right. By the way, again, I swear to you, after July 24th, I'm not bringing that up unless it becomes an issue. Unless it becomes an issue. Kind of, it's been put to bed today. Xander brought up that definitely front will be tough to defend. Five-man fronts definitely will be feisty. Well, you got to get pressure because if you don't get the pressure in a five-man front, and by the way, here's my question about Huff. It's not pass rushing. Will he be able to set the edge versus offensive tackles? You think a 6'1", 245-pound guy who doesn't play defensive end, but you're going to have him out on the perimeter setting the edge so guys don't run wide on you? I'm going to run right at that guy. I want to see if he can play the play the run. He hasn't in his entire five years. He has not shown one ability at all to play on first and second down. I'm going to run right at him. Right at him. Okay? He may be the best pass rusher on that team, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's the best run, run stopper on the team. Here's a guy that played 480 snaps last year. And none of them really in first and second down. Okay? When you line up against Green Bay and their offensive tackles, you really believe that a guy who's never played the run is going to be able to set the edge. Tell you what, he might be able to. How he believes he can, John McMullen thinks he can. He didn't do it in New York at all ever. But in Philly, he's going to. Maybe. Vic put him in a position to win. He could. He could. Remember something. Vic Fangio's ass is on the line with that selection on free agency. You let go Reddick, you put him in. He's got to be a – hey, Reddick wasn't the best run stopper, but he was somewhat effective. He was somewhat effective. Spike goes Green Bay's line is average. Your entire defense was below average. You were 31st. Oh, here's, you know, I, I saw the comment again by Slay. I posted it on my ex. Guy asked the question, it may have been even John McMullen. Hey, do you think that last year, the secondary being a liability on the team, now with all the new players there, that it's been improved? You know what Slay said? I don't think last year the, the defensive back was a liability. I almost fell off my chair when I heard him say that. I was like, bro, that's him saying he played well and everyone else sucked. He still has that mentality. And he tells you he doesn't, but he does. He doesn't think the 31st ranked pass defense was a liability last year. He said that out of his own mouth. I mean, that's not accountability. That's me saying I played well. I was like, you really don't think your last year of defensive secondary was a liability. You really don't think that. And I was like, man, talk about living in denial. Holy shit. Zach Bond will surprise a lot of people, Sills. You're hoping. I'm Me too. Sills, you were taking the same shit when you were talking the same shit when the Eagles played the Rams, Chiefs, Bills, and you were wrong then. Look at Senor talking about segmenting a season. The entire 17-game season was so up and down, it showed you the incompetence 
and it showed you the inconsistency and the cohesiveness. An NFL season is not six games, 12 games. It's 17 regular season games. You don't segment it. Well, we were good for the first half. No, you really weren't because you were exposed in the second half. Think about that, what, what Senor just said. Senor, that's like saying, well, my run defense was great in the first half of the season. Well, how come it fell apart where you were giving up 147 yards a game the last eight games of the year? Well, that was Matt Patricia. Okay, that's an organizational thing. 17 games, my friend. It's not six or 12. You evaluate the entire season, not four games. Well, Jalen Hurts was an MVP candidate for 12. Was Jalen Hurts an MVP candidate by the end of the year? Wasn't even in the top six. What are you talking about? Well, he was for the first 12. Okay. Sure. It's not how you look at shit. You read half a book and say it's a good book? Okay. You, you don't read half a book. And the Chiefs, look, look, look here, here, look at Philly. And the Chiefs lost to us. And then they went to win the Super Bowl. So we can have an up and down season and still be in a Super Bowl. Look at the old Giants teams. Philly, what he doesn't get is that they were going through their. Do you know what the value of a football team is with their quarterback? I learned this lesson the other day from Phil Sims, who we're going to get back on the show here real quick. Do you know what the number one is? No matter what the personnel is, no matter what the coaching is on the team, the deficiencies of the team never go down. Look what happens when you don't have the same talent around Dak. Well, the Cowboys aren't as good. Look at what happens when the same talent's not around Jalen. Football team goes down when they didn't have AJ. The same thing with Brock Purdy. The true evaluation of a football quarterback is if no matter what happens around you, like Lamar Jackson, Lamar didn't have 1,000-yard receiver. He didn't have a guy over 800 yards, and he didn't have a running back over 800 yards and still won the MVP award in 14 games and had home field advantage. There weren't superstar offensive players on that offense last year. It was totally him. You're trying to put superstars around him. He has no talent around him. Tight end was lost in week 10. When you got same thing with Mahomes. Mahomes, his value is no matter who's on the roster, they're good. We're going to find that out about Josh Allen this year. Okay? Yeah. I need to keep a notebook of the lie. I don't tell fucking lies, guy. What are you changing my mind? Let, once again, Senor must be 100 years old. Would you agree? How about this? Would you agree about Jalen Hurts? That you could write a book, three different books on Jalen Hurts' first three years starting. Oh, wait, to, to Jay Brown, flip-flopping. Could you write three different books on Jalen Hurts' career so far? Yes or no? Could you write three completely different books on Jalen's first three years? Okay. You could write three different books. His ability and his career are not going to be set in stone. You make an assessment of one's career when the career is over, not while he's in the middle of it. Billy goes, sure, what's the point? Well, you're flip-flopping on Jalen Hurts for the last three years. He was learning. He was great. Not so great last year. Those are three different conversations and three different opinions. You're supposed to have the same opinion if the guy's not playing well and still revert, revert back to something of three years ago now? That's absolutely stupid. You're only as good as the last game you played, guy. Not two seasons ago. Sills, how does Vic stop bottom 
feeding quarterbacks from having field days against us. And Bradbury and Slade played and still were effect, ineffective against quarterbacks. Ace, I'll say this to you. That the style of defense he's going to play back there with all underneath and not giving up the plus 25 is going to help Bradbury out immensely. I think James Bradbury, if they keep him on the team, could have a bounce back season playing in that system. It wouldn't shock me if he ended up in Arizona because they played that same kind of defense and he had a good season. When you had him do one thing he cannot do, you know why he, do you know why James Bradbury was fired in New York? He was fired in New York because they want press cover corners in New York. He and Slay are not press cover corners. Do you know why the Lions traded Slay when Patricia was there? Because Patricia wanted press cover corners. That played out in Seattle, and it played out at the end of the year when he was trying to press those cornerbacks, and they were getting beat. How many times did Bradbury and Slay reach out and grab guys and take 15-yard penalties for pass interference? Because that wasn't their skill set. You got to play your players to their skill set. Their zone cover corners, plain and simple. Now, the problem with that is you're overpaying for them. You're paying $14 million for cover corners that play zone only and can't press. I'm not doing that. Those guys are just center fielders. Don't get beat deep. That's their number one objective. It's not covering the wide out, it's don't get beat deep. The problem that Minnesota had. With Kirk Cousins, they weren't attacking the underneath zone. They were trying to go deep on Slay, and Slay's very good at that. He uses the sideline well. He's a skill set guy. Shit, Bradbury had an all pro season. You need to attack the Eagles underneath because that's what's going to be the open part of the whole defense is the open zone underneath. Those linebackers ain't worth shit, so I'm going to attack that easily. Now, you know what you're hoping? Here's what Vic Fangio's hoping. In a 10-play drive, Jordan Love makes a mistake. And most likely he will. These quarterbacks make mistakes, especially when you're young. Vic's playing the law of averages. You're not going to complete nine plays in a row against my defense. You may have six really big plays. You're not going to have the plus 25 play. But I don't think you could do seven in a row versus my defense. And I'm going to play the law averages. I think that's becoming a common theme in the league. Okay, I do. I think that becomes a common theme in the league. Eagles should be better. Can't see them being any worse. We'll see. Again, I want to see the defense. I could tell you one thing, Sills. Jalen is going to learn a lot about offensive football by the time he retires. Yeah, he, I mean, why wouldn't he, Sean? He's going to have probably a coordinator. As long as Jalen Hurts is in Philadelphia, he'll have a new coordinator every year. Okay? Dan, like you always say, it's all about seeing the D in real games. Yeah. Then you will have an idea of what you have. Hey, but Charlie, I pretty much know what you have offensively. Right? You pretty much know what you got offensively. You may not know how the chess pieces are going to be moved around, but you pretty much know what you got. You can't make that same proclamation on defense. Devin White and Zach Braun are the two starters today. Not a shocker. Not, not, not a shocker. Um, the offense struggled with that 10 and one record last year. Some of the games they barely won. And Angelo, um, uh, Lane even actually said that on the Rich Eisen show. Okay. I mean, he even said that there were some of those games last year where, hey, man, you know, we pulled it out. Yeah. You know what, though? To, to, to Lane, I'll say this. Yeah, good teams find a way to win, though, dude. You know what I'm saying? Good teams find a way to win. Are the Eagles still going to do the tush push with the new center 
probably going to attempt it. I think that thing's gone. I do not believe that Cam Jurgens is going to have the same effect of Jason Kelsey. Everyone seems to forget that even Carson Wentz was 37 to 39 on fourth and one. And the one dynamic that they had was Jason Kelsey. So he, he was successful with that. Um, I'd like to, like I said, I, I, I came up with an alternative, put Jordan Malata in the backfield and run him at fourth and one. They're not stopping that either. Um, Dean is not even going to start Fangio loves Zach Bond. I think he does. I do. I think he likes him. I think he likes the guy that works hard. The Eagles should have hired a Denard Wilson. And Denard's the D.C. now in Tennessee, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, Tush Push is a football play. Repetition solves all problems. Then how come the Eagles are the only team that really has that kind of success? You don't really think it's just one player? You, you, you don't. So when you're talking about a guy like Jabbar with the sky hook, how come no one's able been able to ever replicate or duplicate the sky hook? You ever think that maybe one guy has a signature play or a signature move that he's known for and that it's his? No, probably not, right? Okay. Or a guy has a particular dunk. Guy has a particular batting stance. Kelsey and Lannon, the most important part for it. Um, yeah. Hey, by the way, Nick, can you can you tell me why Landon and Nick? Or uh, Landon and Kelsey are so important to that um, tush push. Why do you think those two were so important? Why do you think Landon Dickerson, Princess Size? Get low. Almost there. Someone's going to come up with it. Why do you think Landon and Jason Kelsey were so instrumental in the tush push? Size and speed and agility. Getting your head under your hips. Thick legs. Um, it's more simpler than that. They were both centers. Did you ever think of that? They're both centers. You had two centers in the middle of your offensive line. Snap count, correct suplex. Getting the jump on the ball. Okay? Knowing how to get that snap count before everybody else moves. I don't think Cam is as quick as Kelsey. We'll find out. By, by the way, that's why I said I'm not sure if it's not going to work. I want to see how quick Cam is. I want to see how quick Cam is. Andrew, think about it. They had two centers in the middle of the offense. Can you think about that for a minute? You had two centers in the middle of the offense. When it came to pass protection and blitzing and Hertz couldn't pick it up, you had two centers in there telling both – Landon Dickerson and both Kelsey knew exactly where blitzes were coming from. And they're telling the kid and he couldn't pick it up. You got that same dynamic now. You got Cam Jurgens and now you got Landon. You got two centers in the middle of your old line. I can't tell you what an advantage that is. Oh, wait, Cam is quicker. Y'all don't watch our okay. We'll see. You don't know how in the fuck. Prince, do you know if Cam Jurgens is quicker than him when he had like four snaps at center since he's been an Eagle? 
Where did you see that? Where in the world did you see him playing center where you said that they did the tush push and it worked? Where did you see that, that he's quicker? He played guard all year. Well, Kelsey said it. Well, okay. We're going to see it soon. Best old line in the NFC. No, that's not what people say. The guy in Detroit has, they have the best one in Detroit. That Atlanta one's not bad. I think the Eagles are top three. I think the Eagles are top three. Tell you what, I'd like to see a little bit better pass protection this year than we did a year ago. Um, Kelsey over the years was just great at hand-to-hand combat. He surely was. That's why they drafted him, because he's quicker than Kelsey. Okay. We'll find out. But Prince, hey, Prince is – here, here's Prince. My magic – Magic Vapo Rub is telling me he'll be quicker than Kelsey. Yeah. Now we'll see. This is why Jalen Hurts could not get 4K passing yards because the old line pass protection sucked. It's true. And he held on to the ball too much. By the way, What up, Maniac? Maniac, you ever catch any big-time grouper? They still got grouper out there where you are? Or is it still any flounder around? My grandpa and I used to catch flounder all the time. Okay? Kessie will unretire after week eight. You know, hey, get this real. I heard he still got a locker at the NovaCare Center. I, I think that's pretty dope. By the way, before we get on Mark Holmes and Philly 500, this is my final call, my Big Seals personal expectations for the Eagles. I did three of them. Here is the final one. And I'm going to keep this to the side here. Here's what I'm here's my expectations for the upcoming season for your Eagle players. Personal goals. This is not team goals. Personal goals. A lot of flounder for me. Yes, sir. Man, I love flounder. All right. Hertz, thank you very much. Money, thank you, sir. Nick, I think Becton could make a push. Could make the push tush amazing. Uh, we're gonna get to him. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring that up. I'm gonna bring him up here in a second. Okay. I get 4K, 25-plus touch, touchdowns passing for Hertz, and 500 rushing and six touchdowns. That's what I'm expecting this year. You guys are telling me that you think Kellen Moore is going to have this great impact? 4K, 25-plus touchdowns, 500 rushing, and six touchdowns. Is that fair? Is that is that a right around the number that you're looking at? Right? 4K, 25 passing touchdowns or more, 500 rushing yards, and six TDs. Right? Okay. Now, again, I'm expecting these. I'm not sure they're going to get it, but I'm expecting this. Here's what I'm looking for with Barkley. 900 rushing yards. 10 touchdowns. 50 catches. 450 yards receiving. Five touchdowns. And a heck of a pass protector for Jalen Hurts. He's kind of a five-tool player. Would we not agree about Saquon Barkley one thing? It's the first three down back that you've had since Brian Westbrook. You might throw Shady in there, but I don't know what Shady was in pass receiving. But do we not agree that Barkley is probably the best three down back you've had since 
Brian Westbrook. I think that's a hell of an impact. You 15 touchdowns, 1,500 uh, total yards. Heck of a protector, right? Right? Barkley will have over a 1,000 yards. You know what, though? Here, here, Here's why I said 900, NS. What if Barkley has five and a half yards of carry at 900 yards? And he's got another 35, 40 yards a game, receiving in a game. Saquon Barkley could, in theory, have 115 yards, 120 yards in total offense, 110, 15 yards in total offense every game and score a touchdown every game. I'm looking at this right here. You guys are missing the point when I put the numbers together. If you put 950 and 450 together, you're talking 1,500 yards. You're talking about a guy who probably won't play all 17. He's probably going to average you 110 yards in total offense every game and give you a touchdown in every game. Would you take that? Would you take 115 yards in total offense from Barkley in a TD every game? Would you? I don't care about Barkley getting a grand. I care about Barkley being a three-down back. Because that's what you drafted him for, or that's what you signed him for. How about this? You're missing it. A thousand yards. You've had a thousand yard backs. They were no impact on your team. They were very little impact. You didn't use one guy in the Super Bowl after he put the ball on the carpet. That's what you thought of him. And the other guy, you let him walk out the building to Chicago. So what's the point? Getting 1,300 yards? You've had that already. You need to have an impact player back there. 110 yards in total offense and a touchdown every game is impact. 1,500 yards rushing never happened because the ownership doesn't want 28 carries a game. You really think you're going to get a running back that's going to average 115 yards a game, and they're going to be okay with handing the ball off 25 times a game. Get the fuck out of here. Wide receiver. A.J. Brown, 1,200-plus receiving yards, eight touchdowns, and 95 catches. Devontae, I'm going 1,200 here, too. Eight touchdowns, 100 catches. Dallas Goddard. 750 yards receiving, seven touchdowns. I got to lower my expectations. This guy can't stay healthy. Gardner Johnson, four picks. Or it's not worth it. Josh Sweat, eight sacks. Got to get there, son. Especially if you want to have another buyer next year in the offseason. You get eight sacks, you got to have a lot of teams after you. They'll have a lot of teams after you if you get eight sacks this year. Remember, you're not just playing for another year with the Eagles. You're playing, you're auditioning. Remember something, Josh Sweat is auditioning. So he's going to go into this season knowing that. They tried to move me. Well, I'm going to go into this year auditioning for other teams. I think he's going to have a great year. Jalen Carter, I said it yesterday, and I'll stay on it. Nine and a half sacks. My expectations for him. Huff, you have to be 10 plus sacks. I don't think he is, but you have to have 10 plus sacks. Or it's a disaster. Slay. Got to have four picks out of the kid. You can't have three combined with Bradbury and Slay and pay $20 million for two guys. <laughs> hey, you paid 20. You, you understand that. The Philadelphia Eagles paid $20 million for three interceptions between Bradbury and Slay last year. You talk about being 31st, right there, it's in a nutshell. 
20 million dollars for three picks between two dudes let me tell you something dmc dmac if bryce huff gets nine sacks that's a disaster at 18 million dollars Jordan Davis, six sacks, 13th pick, better be Fletcher Cox. Got to pick up those six and a half sacks from somebody. Devin White, eventually somebody's got to get 100 tackles. Your last linebackers can't be TJ Edwards and Kaiser White to get you 100 tackles. That was two years ago. You got to get somebody in there. You can't have a revolving door in there. Looks like the border. Here's what I'm going to do for N'Kobe Dean. This is going to sound awful sad. Hoss, I just want you to play 12 games. I won't be able to make an assessment on if you're good or not. Can you play 12 games, please? Just 12 games. 12. Yeah. Convert Nicobe to the West Coast defense. Forte won't let that rest. The West Coast defense. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. West Coast defense, right? Quinion Mitchell. Love to see three picks out of him. Might be a little lofty. Cooper DeGene, damn shame. I don't really have any expectations for you. It's going to be a red shirt year. Sorry, kid. You're going to miss training camp as a rookie? No way. Vic Fangio, 15th in defense total. Kellen Moore, no lower than third. Shit. That sorry-ass Brian Johnson was eight. Becton, he becomes the swing tackle. Here's the problem with that. So, Makai Becton's going to become the swing tackle. And you're going to want to really give him 15, 16, 17 million dollars. Are you really going to do that, giving up a backup guy that kind of money? He'll go on the open market and get that. He may get 20. Nicobe Dean, 101 tackles, nine TFLs, and eight sacks. There you go, Philly. That's what you're hoping for this year for him? I just want him to play 12 games. He can't play more than two. And he, this guy's got him as a 100-tackle guy. He can't play two games in a row. He's got him at a 100-tackle. Tyler Steen. He wins the right guard spot. You want that to hit. Here's why. If Tyler Steen hits at right guard, that was supposed to be Andre Dillard's spot. They covered it. They covered it. Andre Dillard was supposed to be that guy by now at right guard, having taken over for Sayamalo. And if Steen ends up winning it, you covered it in the draft. Hey, you missed. Hey, the key is if you miss, you come back to the position and you cover it, no harm, no foul. You lose a couple years of equity, but you still righted the ship. Okay? Like here. Like if Dean sucks and you draft a linebacker this coming year and he turns out to be good, you cover that. What you don't ever want to do is cover that shit in free agency because you lose the rookie equity of the contract. You lose all of that. Stoutland, 
you are going to get him right, Sills. I'd like to see Style Tyler Steen. Kenny Pickett fits our new OC better than Jalen. And he will show how dynamic this offense can be if you can spread the ball around. Okay? Imagine hating on a second-string rookie. Who, who, who am I hating on now? You know what? You know what really sucks? 90% of you that are in here that moan and cry and bitch could never be coached. Because coaches you think go, hey, JB, can you please do me a favor? Can you please not get your water now? Because we're in the middle of individual dwells. And then we're going to go over to pass probe. And do you think it would be okay if we sat around with our whoopies and everything will be all right? Is that okay? Baby boy, what the way? Are you all right? I don't want anybody feeling what. <laughs> I surely wish that was that way, but I don't remember Coach Johnson in my ear like that. <laughs> nah, hey, I, I, I don't. Hey, are you all white? Here's how JB wants to be coached. Hey, how can you say those things about my third team cornerback? <laughs> why would you make him feel so worried about? Why, why be so mean? <laughs> hey, dude, do you think this is like um, kindergarten or something? You think these coaches walk out there and go like this, give a shit about your feelings? Line up, fuck you, play. You get paid on Tuesday. Are we going to Talk about pussies, man. Are we going Hey, before I bring in Mark Holmes, man, I bet that's how they talk to him over there. Okay. <laughs> then again, wait a minute. He went to the same school that Charles Haley went to. So they had to do a little bit of barking at that at that school. So I, I got to I, hang on. Hang on here, man. Black a wall? <laughs> I can't believe everybody going to be mean. Hey, Nick's got to also fit into his new role of this new called CEO guy. That was such a bullshit stuff today that went on. But we shall see. Yeah. I mean, some of you guys love to be coached. So, again, Hurts 4K, 25-plus touchdowns, 500 rushing. Barkley, 9. Get this. Before I bring 500 in, too, okay, the greedy Stephen Jones just pushed Jerry to take the bastard daughter out of the will. It, come on, man. I'm not going down that road. Yeah. <laughs> So wait a minute. I, before I get before I get Philly five hundred in here, I said that Barkley will get nine hundred fifty yards rushing and five four hundred and fifty yards receiving, which would be fifteen hundred yards. I say he plays fifteen games. You're trying to tell me you wouldn't want a running back that gives you a game where he's averaging over a hundred yards in total offense and gives you a touchdown every game, and you think that's fucking not productive? And he's one of the best pass pro running backs. How is that not productive? He'll give you more total yards in a game, most of the time as an average for an entire season, than what your two wideouts will give you. What are you talking about? That's how you make that guy productive. You're both your wide, both your running backs the last two years averaged 1,200 yards. They weren't an integral part of that offense. This guy can be. All right. Today's the first day of training camp. And the Cowboys, once again, talking money. The Eagles in that presser thing where they had made sure that Nick Sirianni's feelings were good. Let's bring in the two living legends.